Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Aldersgate, where all are welcome, and all always means all. I'm Vince Fratello, leading the charge this Sunday for those who are not watching the Seahawks. Welcome to our hybrid service, both in the sanctuary and online. Today is Laity Sunday, a day set aside to remember and lift up a constant reality of the priesthood and ministry of all. Every person on the planet is invited to share in God's community of healing, love, justice, and world repair. The church's theme is rise up. Rise up 
and revive God's gift of faith that first lived in those who loved us. Rise up and reveal the grace in Christ that brings life together with, with and for others. Rise up and remain committed to the pattern of healthy words witnessed in those who model a faith. Rise up and retain the, this reliable gift of good and beautiful things placed in our trust by the Holy Spirit. God is not only in this place, but wherever you are. Let us join together in worship. Good morning, church. I'm Joe Lee. Please join me in the call to worship as all. Come, now is the time to worship. We come to worship God who invites us. When the Israelites worshiped the golden calf, God listened to Moses and chose to correct instead of destroy. God persistently invites us to return to God. Jesus tells a story of a wedding banquet where the guests dismissed the invitation and harmed the messengers. So the king invited people off the streets and welcomed all who received the invitation in earnest. God persistently invites us to return to God. Too often we turn from God's ways, choosing our stiff-necked insistence that we know what is best instead of trusting God's provision, love, and guidance. When we turn away and our love fails, God continues to offer us opportunities to return to God and join in the celebration of God's abundant love and love. Come, now is the time to worship. We come to worship God who keeps inviting us for the long haul. Let us pray. God, you invited us to come as a child. You invite us to open our souls to you. You invite us to lay our desires before you. You are fond of us, your children. So we come to you humbly, lovingly, yet confidently. We pray for your world, which you created and called good. Now we see it confused, having lost its way, and refusing to walk in yours. Shine your light in the dark corners of the earth. Ignore, ignite your followers as lamps to show the way. Amen. Join us in singing hymn 368. Um, my hope is built on nothing less. 368.
children to come forward. Or those who are young at heart. <laughs> oh? Oh, there's no way I'm going to let Eric do it. Okay. Well, we, we, we have some folks out here. Please. <laughs> We have some more. Oh, okay. Oh, there we are. Lovely. Hi. Good morning. Welcome. So, are any of you on a team? It could be a sports team. It could be a band. It could be, ah, oh, good, good. <laughs> a choir. It could be uh, a research team doing, doing, you know, lab team doing experiments. Good, good. Sort of, he says. He's not so sure. And, and what happens when a member of the team doesn't show up? It's kind of challenging. Yeah, you're very sad, very sad, yes. Uh, you know, I was watching the University of Washington game yesterday, and I thought, you hoo <laughs> And I thought, you know, the quarterback's out there. He's having stomach cramps. He decided, you know, if he decided, uh, I just, I, I, I don't feel it today, I, I don't think I'll come, that could have been a very, very bad ending to that, that game. Uh, and so it's, this, this business of showing up is important. It's, it's uh, what, we, what we do in life. So what have you done so far this morning for the church? Eric, what did you do this morning? And you lit the candles. You, you do anything at all, Roger? <laughs> we'll move on. I've got a volunteer over here. <laughs> there you go. So, and I know Robin. <laughs> so the, you know, I think the absolute most important thing that all of you did for the church today is you showed up. When we talk about the laity, it's, you know, it's everybody. Everybody but Pastor Wanji, actually. <laughs> and sometimes she gets to be laity, too. And that if I were standing up here and there was nobody out there, that would be kind of silly. I, I actually had an experience in college where the professor was teaching at 8 a.m. Every, every class. And you know college students, they don't like to get up in the morning. And so as the year went on, there were fewer and fewer people that showed up. Until one day somebody came in, it was 20 minutes after 8, and the professor had covered six boards of notes, and nobody was in the seats. So I don't, I don't want this church to ever be that. I want there to be people in the seats all the time, and I thank you for being here in the seats today, because... You know, 90% of life is showing up and the other 10% is showing up prepared. <laughs> Let us pray. God, help us to show up for you and for each other every day in every way. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. <laughs> Well, you may have noticed that Bill and Patty are not here. And uh, since they're not here, and I know they'd be embarrassed if I sung their praises, Bill and Patty do so much work in this church um, that it's amazing that we can still uh, function without them. But we can, and we are. Um, and there are plenty of places to step up and do something. Am, am I correct in saying that this is Laity Sunday? Yes, all right, okay. So, sort of like Volunteer Sunday, right? Um, and I am very, very grateful for these uh, musicians, um, Glenn, David, and Elliot. And uh, this particular song, I love singing and doing this song with musicians, and I just want to explain it. It has special meaning, I think, to we musicians, because we, we do a double thing. When, uh, if we're musicians, we love to play. 
We love to play. We love to, to do what we do to be of worth. Um, and sometimes, I will say this for me very truly, um, sometimes I forget that the real reason to be here, the real reason, is, is to worship God with you. Uh, I get caught up in my job, in, in the excitement of playing with such wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, and, and I asked them all this morning, please remind me when I'm not doing my job. I, I respect their abilities and their opinions, um, but that's what this song's about. So, Elliot, help us out. of endless worth no one could express how much you deserve though I'm weak and poor all I have is yours every single breath I'll bring It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. 
This morning's flowers are in remembrance of Rich Dietering's beloved wife, Linda, in whose honor a birthday candle is lit, remembering her light shines eternal. And the apples are in celebration of Laity Sunday. You are the apple of God's eye. Let us pray. You are with us in every part of our journey, Holy One. You invite us to come and share the fullness of our lives with you. You call us to trust and live in anticipation of your unfolding ways. No one is beyond the reach of your gaze and attention. No one is ignored in your arena of activity. We put our trust in you, Holy One, and are sorting through all of our emotions to understand what it means to stand firm in our faith. Far from igniting fear, your awareness is stirred by concern that all may enjoy justice, freedom, and fullness of life. We pray for courage to be led by you to speak up, question, challenge, and offer alternative actions as Moses did for you. You ask us to remember your favor and help and to be shaped by this growing sense of identity. Your sacred story changes us and gives new meaning to our lives. We pray for compassion as we try to make sense of your loving ways. Holy One, bring us together in the peace we cannot quite understand and bring us more and more into the steadfastness of your love. Reveal to us the way of your love in every emotion. We pray for faithfulness on the journey toward hope and healing. Still, there are things that we don't know. There are things that we cannot know and things that break our hearts with grief and sorrow. We pray for your love in all that is unknown. Holy One, we invite you into our pain and sorrow. We need your comfort and grace. Are there prayers of the people today? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, prayers for all the people who are suffering in Israel who, and who have lost loved ones. Thank you. Prayers for Heather, who is in a head-on collision with many broken bones. Yes. Prayer for David's health issues, which will require life-changing. Prayers for Kathy and Dave, maybe, and for everyone else involved in uh, emptying out the house. Amen. Wanji. Other prayers? Okay. And
Oh, one more. Thank you. And now, let us pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. That was great. One. Draw near and hear from St. Matthew's Gospel, our reading from chapter 22, verses 1 through 10 and 14. We're reading from the Inclusive Bible. Then Jesus spoke to them again in parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like this. There was a ruler who prepared a feast for the wedding of the family's heir. But when the ruler sent out workers to summon the invited guests, they wouldn't come. The ruler sent other workers telling them to say to the guests, I have prepared this feast for you. My oxen and fatted cattle have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding. But they took no notice. One went off to his farm, another went to her business, and the rest seized the workers, attacked them brutally, and killed them. The ruler was furious and dispatched troops who destroyed those murderers and burned their town. Then the ruler said to the workers, the wedding feast is ready, but the guests I've invited don't deserve the honor. Go out to the crossroads in the town and invite everyone that you can find. The workers went out into the streets and collected everyone they met, good and bad alike, until the hall was filled with guests. Many are called, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. A few months ago, Roger came up to me and said, I have a great idea for a sermon. If we build it, will they come? Well, of course, my mind flashed onto the movie Field of Dreams, but as I look out at our back 40, I just don't see a way to fit in a ball field. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure where I would go with it, but it was a good idea, and I put it in the back of my head and let the Holy Spirit work on it. So I was not shocked when I woke up at 4 a.m. one morning and it had become clear. The lectionary scripture I chose this morning is the gospel scripture from Matthew. I have a confession to make. I have excised three verses from the end. The UMC Discipleship Ministries website used the same scripture but made the whole message about those three verses, which I thought that missed the point, or at least it missed my point. You can go back and read them if you like. But here is what I see in the message about God's invitation. God invited people to the wedding who did not come. What was the solution? Invite everyone. No filter. We are all invited to God's house, to this house. We should invite all we meet. That is the thing that we are building. The United Methodist Church mission statement has this to say. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world by pro proclaiming the good news of God's grace and exemplifying Jesus' command to love God and neighbor. Local churches provide the most significant arenas through which disciple-making occurs. Pope Francis has made inviting everyone a theme of the latest Catholic Synod, which emphasizes the universal need throughout all who follow the path of Jesus. While we may be a bit farther along in inviting everyone in the Catholic Church, we still have miles to go. We are to be the living embodiment of the Great Commission given to the Apostles we need to keep our eyes on this prize. We are here to grow. But is that what is happening? There's no question that churches in America are shrinking. In 2007, Pew Research found that 16% of Americans described their religion as none. In 2014, that rose to 23%. And in 2021, aided by the pandemic, 
it was a whopping 29%, almost double in 14 years. Increasingly, there are a large number of people who simply feel they don't fit in the box that organized religion seems to have defined for itself or been put into. Often young people who are uncomfortable with orthodoxy and, quite frankly, uncomfortable with a reputation for intolerance that churches have brought on themselves. It is not what Jesus taught. Jesus was about the big tent. Listen to the list from Pentecost. Devout people from every nation under heaven, heaven, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, as well as visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs too. We need to be the living embodiment of that inclusivity. It's not as if the United Methodist Church is not putting out a good product. In 2018, Pew Research Center study of the ways religion influences the daily lives of Americans finds that people who are highly religious across a variety of traditions are more engaged with their extended families, more likely to volunteer, more involved in their communities, and generally happier with the way things are going in their lives. Two-thirds donated money, time, and goods to help the poor in the past week. As a result, 40% described themselves as very happy. So why is this hard? Why is the world not flocking to love one another as I have loved you? We need to be the living embodiment of that love. Aldersgate has done a great job of putting out a quality service week in and week out over the course of the pandemic. What encourages me most is that we are applying the continuous improvement principle to all aspects of our service and doing it in a way that connects us better with God. Look, we are not going to be, we don't want to be, a mega church with a dozen paid staff, a trendy following, and the unfortunate scandals that seem to go with it. We just want to be us, a better version of us, a continuously better version of us. I love our musicians. Our music program has long been a strength. As a worship leader, I really appreciate the ability to work with such a team to craft a curated musical experience that reinforces and builds on the message. By hiring Jim Peterson to bring back in-person choral singing, we have reintroduced an element that Pastor Juan G. describes as being critical to a traditional church and critical to the community of people who have lost their traditional church who might walk in these doors. And our singers are really good, aren't they? <laughs> Jim raves about the skill set of the choir. But these are hard times, and there are days where it's hard to get a quorum. Modern music is also critical to the new and younger group of people we need to attract. We are fortunate to have a group, bunch of great musicians and a talented professional to lead our praise band. Roger has set his eyes on continuous improvement. We've got a new keyboard player to add depth to our long-term dedicated players. The next step will be getting the sound we have here in the sanctuary out to the online community. And I know that Roger can do that with a little time and maybe a little money. Everyone who wants to join anything looks for people that look like them, especially in positions of leadership. Bellevue is over half Asian and the world is half women. We chose our pastor because she felt like the right person for us at this time. But it's not lost on me that she is an Asian woman and that that stands out in a very positive way. Yet, it is an unescapable fact that we are smaller than we were pre-pandemic. Oh, the number of people pledging every year has not changed much. Still sitting around 80 people. But what we have lost is the occasionals, the walk-ins. People who put a contribution in the plate, sometimes as often as every week, 
but weren't willing to attach and are now positively detached. And we aren't adding back. The number of new members does not even come close to matching the losses. We are not alone. Actually, Aldersgate is doing the best of the Bellevue Methodist churches and better than many denominations. In the coming years, the impact of the loss of attendance will result in the closing of a number of churches, and already has in some cases. St. Peter's and Bellevue First are already sharing a pastor because, you know, not only are there fewer people attending church, there are fewer people in ministry prepared to preach and give pastoral care. In the lectionary scripture this week from the Hebrew Bible, it describes the story of the golden calf and how wroth God was with the Israelites. What happens next is actually described best in Psalm 106, that bad things are about to happen had not Moses, God's chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. There is a breach, a breach between God and humanity, a breach between the church and those who are invited. Who will stand in the breach? Who will step up to heal this troubled relationship? Why not us? A more important question might be, how do we do it? What do we have here that makes us stand out as the place to be? What are the things we do that might turn people away, that have turned people away? How can we be better? What do we need to build so they will come? Because I can tell you now that we are not yet drawing enough new people through that door. And our biggest problem is we don't know why. Oh, we have some ideas why people have left the church, have left our church. During the pandemic, people got in the habit of doing other things on Sunday mornings. Many people moved. Some have passed into the great cloud of witnesses. Some have left in response to conflicts, as Pastor Wanji preached on two weeks ago. Some have chosen to worship elsewhere, and some worship now in small groups on their own. But I don't think we really know what those who have always been unchurched are looking for, because if we did, we would be doing something about it. We need to understand those people better. I'll be blunt. There's a significant amount of stuff in the Bible that is hard to swallow if you take it too literally. Churches all over the world are alienating people by overusing some marginal passages to be exclusionary, and they are shrinking as a result. But the Gospels, the words of Jesus, those are pure ambrosia. Those are what we live on, what we can build on. That is our message. When I first started preaching, Brad said to me, mention God early and often. Our messages are rooted in scripture and very specifically rooted in the gospels. Because remember this, the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We are not making disciples of Abraham, of David, or even of Paul. We are making disciples of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to take a shot at some things here, putting on my corporate America marketing hat. And I should tell you, I am the world's worst marketer. What is the product we are selling? We need to appeal both to our core constituency, the people who are sitting here, and others who look like us, who may have lost their church, newly moved to the area, or are just looking. But we also need to appeal to the unchurched, the marginal attendees, the marginalized people, the young people looking for inspiration. They used to say about my wife's ex-father-in-law, a missionary and Methodist minister, that George did not make his living on Sundays. He was an indifferent preacher, 
but an amazing pastor to the rural community they lived in. We will not succeed without pastoral care, and Pastor Wanji does a great job of that. But that's to the group already here. If we want more, we can't do outreach to 100 different constituencies by her alone. On this Laity Sunday, we can't just build what this small constituency wants. We have to examine if people will come to what we are building, or if there is more we need to offer not just on Sunday morning, but all week long. In the 21st century, we need more than just a compelling in-person Sunday worship service. In our Bishop Cedric Bridgeforce MILE initiative, he has emphasized the need for the laity to become a more active voice in our church and community. What more can we say, do, and be that will make people find God in this place? Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. Actually, I think he said massage, the way he pronounced it, but same thing. People won't hear it if it is not packaged accessibly to them. Which brings us to our online worship. How do we make that must-see TV? Because young people expect that. They live on their devices and need to be able to worship where and when they choose. I know the tech team is working on the weakest link in our online experience. Right out there, it's happening now, the internet connection. And there will soon be a new lighting in the church that will be less intrusive. Continuous improvement. So, what about community? What about being the community of God? What about standing in the breach? What about building relationships the way Jesus did? Not just sitting with the temple authorities, but with the sinners, the tax collectors, the Samaritans. You know, people like you and me, and the rest of the world that we would like to have walk through these doors. Because unless we go to them first, they will not walk through these doors. We don't actually know what they want, and that scares me more than anything. When I went back for one of my high school reunions, I was chatting with some classmates and noted that we had not seen one of our classmates at any of the reunions. One of my friends looked pensive and she said, I don't think he felt he could be authentically himself here. My first thought was, duh, why did I not see that? And why did I not do a better job of making him welcome? My second thought was, that was an awfully perceptive comment coming from someone who spent her whole life living in a conservative small town. I would like to think we have all been educated by life and the people we have met and can make perceptive comments like my friend did. At Aldersgate, we have made the choice to be a reconciling congregation. We want to be a place where everyone who walks through that door can be authentically themselves. But do the people we are saying we accept unconditionally actually know that if they aren't already in the building? Maybe we have to say that to every person we meet and a whole bunch of people we would not ordinarily meet. Maybe we have to ask them what they want and need. Baby boomers like me only have a 2.6% chance of identifying as LGBTQ+. In millennials, that rises to 10.5%. And for Gen Z, it is 21%. One in every five young people you know. I feel pretty confident that biology and the human mind have not changed in that time. So a lot of people in our generation were actually afraid to be authentically who they were. I know a number of those have come out since, which was often hard since they had established lives, marriages, children. It is critical for us to build a place where everyone can be themselves. Cammie Fritzi once said to me that hers was the generation that made youth groups safe. Sadly, we are now in a bit of an uproar with our youth ministry. We need to reconnect with that thought of being a safe place in the middle of an emotionally dangerous world. Let's face it, middle school is Lord of the Flies. 
The fallacy is not that others are different. The fallacy is that we aren't. Kids get that. They know perfectly well they are different, even when they don't want to be. We all feel like outcasts sometimes. That's why the terminology in the world is moving from safe space to a more expansive term, brave space. In many contexts, safe spaces have come to mean siloing of people, so they don't have to hear differing opinions. We want to hear the different opinions. Yes, this has to be a place that is safe for everyone marginalized, traditional, transitional, and transcendent. But beyond that, it needs to be a space where we can love, see, and accept each other's differences and love each other as we are here a place of civility and respect where everyone can bravely be their authentic self. I'm an old straight white guy, and I will likely never transcend that reality. But I can make common cause in the love of Christ with anyone who wants to join us. Maybe we need to invite more than just our current youth to this brave place, and maybe more than on just Sundays. What are we building what should we build? In the field of dreams, the protagonist builds his field, gets Shoeless Joe Jackson and a bunch of old ball players to come out of the cornfields. But he also gets an unexpected guest in the presence of his father. We are trying to build something here that will draw new disciples from every portion of society for the transformation of the world and for our own personal transformation. But in the end, we are also seeking to draw our heavenly parent as we heal the breach between God and humanity. We are seeking to have our sibling, Jesus Christ, in our midst, sitting with every sort of person, just as he did in life. And if we can build that, they will come. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in the prayer of dedication? Thank you, Holy One, for the fire in our bellies and the hope in our hearts. It is with every emotion that we share these gifts with your people. May they conspire with the work of your steadfast love. Amen. So when uh, I got the email from Vince that he was preaching, he goes, hey, you remember that song you wrote about everybody leaving the church? <laughs> I go, well, I, I don't think it was meant that way. Uh, so this song comes back from around 2017, and we were uh, just kind of rolling out our days of service um, where uh, we were encouraged to leave the church and go out there in the world. You mean, stuff. you mean leave the church building? Leave the church building, <laughs> yes. Thank you, David. So, so the first line is, everybody leave the temple. Well, I, I know it's not a temple, but I really respect meter and poetry, and it just had to be temple. It couldn't be everybody leave the church because that just sits there and dies. So uh, hopefully you'll remember this song, and I'd love it if you'd sing along.
Sunday. As your pastor, I'm so grateful for each and every one of you, and thank you for showing up. And I invite us, as since pre preached, to show up in that deep, in the gap, in that expanse of gray space in which humanity and God, there is no disconnection. So let us all rise up, go into our world sharing the good news. May you go knowing that God invites you today and every day to partake in the abundant life and love God has for you. So may we receive honor and celebrate the grace that softens our stubbornness and opens our hearts to share God's love with one another. Amen.